Be holy. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on the Father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in the last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so in your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that, has, that, ha, that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted the Lord, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, this is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Tasia. Hey, before we jump into this week's message on First Peter, I just want to share some really good news. It's been a long time coming for Oak Point Canton. Uh, as many of you know, we have been looking for a place to have a ministry center or administrative offices or however you want to look at it uh, since before we launched on February 2nd, 2020. And there have been two or three times where we have gotten down to the point of signing something and thinking it was about to happen this week and we're about to move in and all this stuff. And we have had several different types of interruptions happen to the last minute. But I am happy to announce that tomorrow we are moving into a ministry center for our midweek ministries and staff to do officing and meetings and all sorts of different things. So we are praising God for his thankfulness. Let's give him a round of applause this morning. It is uh, the ministry center. If you go out the front doors and you turn right and then you turn left where Ridge jogs south, it's the second smaller white building on the right. Um, and it, it's, it's uh, right next to that little cut short kind of memorial uh, statues that they have right there. Uh, it's in that building. It's about a 2,600 square foot building. Uh, perfect space for us for, for a lot of different things that we'll be using over time. So Look out tomorrow on social media for some kind of like a walk through, you know, tour or whatever uh, on our social media accounts. We would love to show that to you. So we're really excited about that and just pray that everything, you know, goes through. I like, you know, I've announced before that we're on the verge of going into a place, but this time we, we know we have a, we have a great confidence that God is providing this place for us. We feel like it's what he's been asking us to wait for this entire time. So really, really exciting. Who here grew up watching Toy Story or maybe watched it as an adult and just has enjoyed that movie? Yeah, that, that, I can remember that movie coming out and I did not know that it was going to endure the way that it has. But I remember at the beginning of the first movie, uh, Buzz Lightyear, he, he thinks, not the beginning, but all throughout the first movie, but for most of the movie, he thinks that he is actually a space ranger right? He thinks that that is who he is. And at some point towards the, the second half of the movie, spoiler, but again, if you have had 20 years to watch it, I don't care about spoiling things. He, he realizes, I am, not, uh, I am not actually a real life space ranger. And it causes like a, a whole crisis in Buzz Lightyear's toy brain that he's like, what am I going to do? Like, I, I'm not who I thought I was. And he really, he kind of gets despondent. He stops like doing all the heroic acts or attempting them. He stops trying to rescue himself and Woody from the Sid, the evil kid next door's evil lair. Uh, he, he's like, he just kind of gives up on life. And uh, there's this time where uh, Woody is trapped underneath a milk crate with a toolbox on top. And he's like... He's like, Buzz, come, come, you got to save me. We got to get out of here. And he's just like, eh, what, what's the point? I'm, I'm not a real space ranger. He's like, what? 
let me tell you who you are. You, you are Andy's toy. And he's like, you are the coolest toy ever. You're, you know, you're better than a space ranger. You're the best toy. And he goes on and on and he's telling him how he's awesome. And at the end, he's like, you're a really cool toy, you know, and something sparks in Buzz Lightyear. And he actually, he, this part's pretty cool. He looks at the bottom of his foot where Andy has written his name to, uh, you know, imprint him as his, as his toy. And it's in that moment, he remembers who he is because he remembers who he belongs to. And uh, it, it like wakes him up. And then, and then the next thing you know, uh, Woody's kind of feeling sad. And he turns around and he doesn't see Buddy or Buzz there anymore. And he's like, where'd he go? And then all of a sudden he's pushing the toolbox off the top of the milk crate and they're about to save the day. And uh, the, whole, the whole movie gets, uh, you know, turns on, its, on, on a dime right there. So it's just a really cool scene. But, but what happens is um, Buzz's behavior and his heroic activity and the things that he's going to do and accomplish, they're all based out of his understanding of who he is and even who he belongs to in that moment. And in the same way, this whole letter of 1 Peter, we started out last week, and, and a lot of what we started with is Peter telling the people of their identity. They're going through suffering, but remember, you are God's chosen people, and you're scattered around, and, and yet you, you belong to God, and he has given you this gospel. You've received this salvation. You belong to him. Therefore, here is how you should live. He turns a corner in the passage that we're looking at this week, where Peter tells them how they should live, but it comes off of the heels of last week where he's telling them who they are and who they belong to in order to motivate this kind of living. It's important for us to remember this, that, who, that what we do actually flows out of who we are and not the other way around. So often as we walk through life, the temptation is to say, I'm defined by the, the things that I do, so therefore I'm going to just really try, real, I'm going to try really hard, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to accomplish things, and that's going to tell me my identity. When it comes to walking through this life with God, he says, no, here is your identity. Now live out of your identity. It's an important, it seems like a subtle difference, but it's an important difference. Because it, it really, it, it's in our approach to God, how can we have a relationship with him? We can't earn it. We can't get there on our own. We can't do something to make him love us or make, a, make him bless us or make him give us a gift. We can just receive that and then live out of the result of that. So we have to make sure we get those things the right way around. And usually when you're looking through scripture, when there's, commands about how we are to live, like this passage we're looking at today, it's flowing out from some facts about who we are and who we belong to. So that's where we are in First Peter, our second week, as we're making our way through this book, this somewhat ignored book throughout the course uh, of church history. And we're going to pick up right here, and, and Tasia already read this passage for us, but we're going to kind of Work through slowly as we talk about this passage. Verse 13 of 1 Peter chapter 1 says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So the first thing that we are called to be, the first thing that Peter's calling his audience to be, and this applies to us as well, he, we are called to be hopeful. We are called to be hopeful. We already talked about last week how we are given a living hope, but today he's, he is calling us back into this hope. And he actually says, be alert. And the, there's an idiom here, like a saying in, in the original Greek. It it's basically reads literally to gird up the loins of your mind. Now, what does that mean? Back in that day, uh, people would wear long cloaks and clothing and their outer shirt, so to speak, would all go all the way down to the ground. And so like if someone was going to run, they had to, and particularly like a man would be usually the one uh, in this sort of scenario, he'd be girding up his loins and stuck, stick, stuffing it in his belt so that his legs could move freely. It would make him more readily available to move around, and that's what that would mean. So if you're preparing for something, you're becoming alert or ready for action, uh, that, that's what you would do. So that's literally what's being said here. The best uh, maybe English comparison would be like roll up your sleeves, you know, get ready to, to work, get ready to get after it. And, uh, but since it's an idiom, it, we're not meant to like literally read it that way and think, read too much into the, the imagery of that. But what he's really trying to say is captured fairly well, I think, in, in our English translations to have our minds be alert to be ready, to be prepared, um, that, that we are uh, prepared with hope, to set our hope on him. 
And he also says to be, uh, to be fully sober. An idea here, the idea would be to be self-controlled. And all of this based on the hope that we are given. A biblical hope is not like a wishful hope. Like that we hope maybe, uh, you know, when, when you're younger, maybe uh, I hope that tomorrow is going to be a snow day, not in the spring, but like in the middle of winter, I hope it's going to be a snow day. Or occasionally uh, one of my kids wants a day off of school, so they start hoping for some random occurrence. Now, one of the middle schools was closed a couple weeks ago due to a power outage. So the younger ones in the elementary school who feel like they got ripped off of a day off of school, they'll be like, it's not, we're not going to have school tomorrow. I'm like, why not? Well, there's going to be a power outage or something like that. That's wishful thinking. It's a hope. And I've told them it's not, it's not going to happen. And they're like, how do you know? I'm like, well, technically I don't, but I'm pretty sure that there's going to be power at your school tomorrow. So you should not be uh, hoping, like wishing for that and, and setting your hope on it. On this case, Peter is saying, do set your hope on this because it's not a wishful act or wishful thought. It's true. It's what's going to happen. It's what's going to happen. It's, a, it's something that has happened in the past, but that is going to come into full fruition in the future. So this future hope is based on an action or an act that God has began in the past. And so that's why our hope can be so certain and sure uh, on, on the, the fact that Jesus is going to return. He's going to bring us to his kingdom and that we have a certain hope and a sure hope in Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We talked about last week a little bit about the idea that uh, we, we have been justified, which is a legal standing before God. This is something that has already occurred for those of us who have walked into faith with Jesus Christ and received the free gift of salvation. We are now justified before God. Uh, We have been. That's an event that happened in the past and that continues on. Now we are in the process, though, and and, and the justified is being being saved from from the penalty of sin. We also are being sanctified, becoming more like Christ. And that's what Peter's talking about right here in this passage. This is a process. This is a process of sanctification. It's a process of being freed from the power of sin over our lives. And in the future, there will be another event where we will be glorified. Uh, We will be brought into his presence. We will be freed from the presence of sin in our lives. We'll come out of this world where, where sin is rampant, and we will be in a place where it's perfect and holy and to be with God. In, in a perfect relationship with him. So it's, it's a sort of a now but not yet sort of aspect to our faith. And this hope is pointing to that. We have it now. We are certain of it that it's going to be fully ours because it's based on something that's happened in the past, but we are not going to fully realize it until the future. It's the completion of what has been started. So this idea of, of being fully sober, that fully word could actually be there to modify set your hope. Uh, it's a little bit ambiguous in the Greek, but it may be to fully set our hope. And the bottom line, one thing that we see very clearly in, in this passage and in this book is that our hope is really only to be on one thing. And how many of us have learned that lesson the hard way when we have set our hope on something, uh, a thing in this world or a promise of this world or a person in this world, anything less than God, that hope always ends up disappointing us. When we put our hope in, in material things, we realize they don't last forever. Or sometimes we lose them even in this life and they cannot carry us into the next life. Uh, when we put our hope in someone else, they're going to let us down because they're not perfect, they're not God. That's just how it goes. Whenever we put our hope in something that's not him. So he's calling us to set our hope fully on him. No hedging our bets to keep our minds fixed on the final outcome. And for the people that Peter is writing to, this is so important in light of the trials and the troubles that they are facing in this world. And so they they keep their minds fixed on that hope, the final outcome, so they can overcome all things in the midst of their trials. So they're living now in light of the future. That's what Peter is calling them to do. We are called also to be hopeful. And whatever it is that we're going through, whatever uh, place in life that we have right now, we are called to be hopeful. Verse 14, it says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Secondly, so we are called to be hopeful first. Secondly, we are called to be holy. We are called to be hopeful. We are called to be holy. God wants his children, he doesn't want the apple to fall far, far from the tree, so to speak. He wants his children to be like him in this sense. 
and he wants us to be to to represent him. God is holy first and foremost. We see that God's holiness is really probably the most prominent character trait about him because it's the only thing that the only thing that he's called uh, he's not called I mean he is loving and he is love, but he's not called loving loving loving. He's not called uh, good good good. He's called holy holy holy. Now he is all of those things and he's totally all of those things. But there's an emphasis in a sense on the holiness. We see it in Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, we see it in Revelation 4 as well. Um, those verses might pass by real quick, but I'm, I'm not going to read them. But basically they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. It's this idea, and the angels are singing this song before God's throne at all times. And basically it's just it's calling him holy. It's the number one trait of who God is. And this idea of being holy, it's really where we get our series name. It's to be set apart, consecrated, altogether different. That's what holy is, set apart in its own and it's unique. And God is fully, he's completely holy. And Peter reaches back into the Old Testament. He reaches back into Leviticus where this, this idea is quoted four times. There's four variations of this, of this same uh, thought, to be holy just as I am holy. He reaches back into Leviticus. And Leviticus, if you know anything about it, if you've uh, ever done a Bible reading plan, Leviticus is where you quit. Um, I'm just kidding. Hopefully you made it through. It's actually, it's very difficult to read if you don't know what you're reading about. But basically, it's God. Uh, he is telling his people, I think Gary said that to me last week. I got to give credit where credit's due. Where, he's running the camera. You did. You said that to me. You, that's where reading plan, Bible reading plans go to die, okay? And I just stole your joke. Uh, uh, so basically, he, he is, uh, he's talking about this whole book of the Bible that is dedicated to helping the Israelites understand how they're supposed to be different than all of the people around them. How they are supposed to be set apart. And so Peter here, talking to this crowd, uh, talking to this group of, of persecuted Christians, he reaches back into the Old Testament, into Leviticus, into this book that's all about how God's people are to look different than the people groups around them who are practicing all sorts of different uh, religions and some, a lot of things that were pretty awful in terms of how they were approaching the gods and, and saying, here's, here's how you are not to represent me in that same way. Here's how you are to stand out among these nations and to be a people set apart for me. And so in the same way, we are called to be set apart for God. He's, Peter is basing the command here on their relationship with God as God being the father and us being the children. And he makes it clear that, that being a child of God means changing the way that they live. In fact, in this passage, there's a whole bunch of examples, uh, I think like five examples here of things that, ways that he compares their life formerly and their life now. So formerly, uh, they, they lived in ignorance of God. Now, they live with knowledge of God uh, and of Christ. Formerly, they were not God's children or people. Now, they are God's children and people. Formerly, they were controlled by their desires. Now they're controlled by obedience. Formerly, they had a futile way of, futile way of life. Now they're living a holy way of life. Formerly, they were affirmed by society. Now they are misunderstood and maligned by society. This comes from Karen Jobes pointed this out uh, in, in a commentary, Baker Exegetical Commentary. And, and essentially, this idea, as, as you're working through, there's so many ways that we are to then look different because of the, the implications of following Jesus, becoming a child of God. Paul has the same type of messaging uh, all the way through his, his letters as well. In Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 22 through 24, uh, he says this to the, to the church in Ephesus. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self. Catch this, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. There's so much overlap here between what Paul's saying and what Peter is saying. They, they both refer to their desires, the deceitful desires or the evil desires that they used to have. They're both referring to something that, that used to be, and now there's, there's something new that's in its place. And they're both referring to that, that calling, that newness, that, that change in our identity leading to a, an increase in our righteousness and our, hol our holiness to make us like God. 
in, in that sense. We're never going to be perfect the way that God is perfect, but he calls us towards perfection. He calls us towards his character. He calls us to be hopeful, and he calls us to be holy. Let's look at verse 17. He continues on. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. We are called to be, number three, we are called to be reverent. Even, you could even say fearful, but we, I know we respond a little bit diff- It's a little tough for us in the Western world with this, with this idea of, of this reverent fear. Let's talk about what that looks like, what that means for a second. Uh, the fear here is not the same as like a dread or an anxiety that you have. You're not like afraid that God is going to lash out and do something that, you know, out of nowhere. That, that's, not, that's not our fear. Think of it more like this. So, uh, you know, when you, when, you get out, when you go out of your house and you want to go someplace, basically everything in our culture where we live right now is set up uh, for most of us to, to be something you have to drive to get to that place. Like almost all the time. Uh, unless you live in a city or on a college campus, which some of us do, um, you, you are probably driving most of the places that you're going. Now, somehow we have come to the place where we, we find that it's normal to travel like upwards of 70 miles, 80 miles per hour in a giant hunk of metal. And that our, I mean, like, I can't even throw a ball 80 miles per hour. And that's how fast we're hurtling down the freeway. And we just think this is normal. But when we stop and think of it, every once in a while, maybe you'll, you'll see an accident or come close to having, and you, you'll be sobered about the, the reality that this is a very dangerous thing that we're doing. And uh, hopefully we think about it every time, actually, that we drive, because it, it is, in fact, a very dangerous thing that we're doing. And we need to be extremely careful. And they teach you this when you're in driver's training, that, uh, that you are driving what can be used as a deadly weapon. And you have to be extremely careful when you are operating that piece of machinery. You have to be extremely careful. You basically operate it with a sense of fear. But you're not like nervous or scared when you're doing it because you get used to doing it. So you're not like, it's not like throwing you off. You're not afraid of it, but there's like a reverence and a sense of fear of what it's, it's capable of and what it is able to do. That's sort of the sense in which, that it carries over to, to God. You know, and even, even the way a child, a child child obeys, they have a loving relationship with their father. They're not afraid to approach their father, hopefully in a healthy relationship. They're not afraid to come to their father in the middle of the night if they have a need. They're not afraid of any of that. And yet there is a sense of respect, again, when the relationship is balanced and healthy, that causes that child to be obedient to their parent. And so it's not a fear or a dread or an anxiety in that sense. It's a fear and a healthy, which is a healthy response in the presence of an altogether different being, holy being, set apart being from us. And so this idea of, this, of the Father suggests that both those things, intimacy and love, but also respect and submission to him. So our familiarity with God as our Father, that is a good thing, but we cannot let that degrade our sense of awe, and uh, we cannot let it degrade his holiness in our eyes. So he's both. He carries on, verse 18, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as gold or silver, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you uh, from, from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. He gives us a couple of reasons here to have this reverence for God, this reverent fear of God. Two reasons. Number one is our father is also going to be our judge, and he's also watching the things that we are doing in this life. And so we're living under his watchful eye, and it's, he's, our, he's our ever-present father, but he's also our ever-present judge who's walking along with us. So that's one reason. Number two is that we were redeemed by Jesus' death from our former way of life, um, and, and we were redeemed into something new, a new way of life. And so those are the reasons we need to live with this fear. And that cost was high. The words that he uses here um, in, in the Greek, it's kind of like, it's almost a play on words, or it could be seen as a play on words, because he's talking about uh, it, that it was not with gold or silver that we were purchased, right? We were not, we were not purchased with, with gold and silver, but, but something much more precious 
Not with perishable things such as gold and silver. So the idea uh, of the gold and silver, this would have been a, a normal activity in that day and age. Slavery existed in this time period. And people could purchase their, their freedom. They, they could purchase their freedom. We're going to welcome our kids in because they're going to come in to watch baptism. So here's, here comes Oak Point kids, and they're going to quietly sneak into the front row. All right, uh, so they're going to be doing that just for a second. just want to make sure you know what's going on. Why are these shorter people walking into the room? All right, so when he talks about the, the perishable things, the gold and the silver, if there was a, a, a slave who was able to purchase their freedom, they would go to a pagan temple... And they would pay for their freedom through the temple with their gold and their silver. They would give that over. The temple would receive it and the treasurer would actually return, less the commission, return the sum back to the the master, the owner of the slave. And then that slave would have their freedom. And in the master's eyes, that slave would be a freed person. But in the eyes of society, they would also, in in a different way, they would also be a slave to whatever God who was at the temple where they went to purchase their freedom. And the word for that payment, that the word for their payment of, of purchasing their freedom is to me. Okay, to me. That was, that was the payment that they would put down and then they would have their freedom. Now, that word does not happen. We don't see that word in this passage, but we do see something very similar. It says that it talks about when we are purchased by uh, the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, when that's what has, when he's the one who has purchased our freedom, uh, the precious blood of, of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. The word for precious is tamio, tamio. Okay, so uh, it's like tamio. It, it sounds just like that other word, tami, tamio. And essentially, it's like this play on words saying that you have been bought and now you belong to Jesus. That is, that is the, redeem, the redeemer for us. And then we are now considered, even in, in this sense, and we see this elsewhere in scripture, we are now considered slaves of Christ. He is now our, our owner and our master. And the good thing about that is he is the one, he is the only one who, who should be able to have ownership or claim ownership over any human being. And when we are in, in service to him, we are where we are exactly, we're exactly where we are created to be serving him, loving him, walking with him. So we are called to be reverent towards our father, towards our judge, towards our redeemer. Um, so we are called to be, uh, we're called to be hopeful. We are called to be holy. We are called to be reverent. Number four, we are called to be loving. We are called to be loving as well. Let's pick it up in verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. We are called to be loving. And again, we're given reasons why we are called to be loving. The first one is because our lives has, have been set apart by obedience to truth with the purpose of relating how, uh, what God says about us, all right? So we, we are living in relationship to, to who, who God says that we are, and we've been set apart by obedience to truth. Now that you've been purified, now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other. So that causes us to have this love for each other. We, our lives have been set apart and in our obedience to the truth. That, that, that causes us to live the way God wants us to live. And that is the primary thing that he measures us with is, is with love. He measures our, our hearts with love and our growth with love. That is really where our calling is uh, to become people, uh, not just that, are, that know more about God, not just have, that have read the Bible more times, not just that pray all the time. Although those things lead to something that's becoming more God-like and that manifests itself primarily in human beings' lives by being more and more loving. And that's an important thing for us to understand. He, he carries on. Let me reread uh, verse 23. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are, are like grass. All their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that has been preached to you. The second reason we're called to be loving is that we've been reborn with an eternal nature. With love, again, as the defining characteristic of that nature. I'm going to read a selection here from a book called Practicing the Way by John Mark Comer that talks about this idea of love. 
of becoming people of love. It says, an apprentice of Jesus is one who has arranged their life around becoming like Jesus as expressed through their personality, gender, life stage, culture, ethnicity, and so on. But if you had to summarize Christ-like character in one word, there would be no competition. Love. Love is the acid test of spiritual formation. The single most important question is, are we becoming more loving? Not are we becoming more biblically educated or practicing more spiritual disciplines or more involved in church. Those are all good things, but not the most important thing. If you want to chart your progress on the spiritual journey, test the quality of your closest relationships, namely by love and the fruit of the Spirit. Would people who know you the best say you're becoming more loving, joyful, and at peace, more patient, less frustrated, kinder, gentler, softening with time, and pervaded by goodness? Faithful, especially in hard times, and self-controlled. We are called to grow in all of these areas, and the number one uh, indicator for our hearts is how are we loving? How are we loving those around us? Let's finish with these first three verses of First Peter chapter 2, where he says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now, first of all, there's a couple other places where the idea uh, uh, of of milk as nourishment come into play, but both of those other occasions it's being used as sort of a negative illustration, meaning, why are you still so young in the faith that you need milk and not solid food or not meat? We see this in Hebrews, and we see it in, I think it's 1 Corinthians, and uh, 1 Corinthians 3, and this idea is being used very differently here. So we have to kind of put those outside of our minds. What we gen- generally do when we have a pretty good knowledge or handle on God's word is we start relating passages, and we should. That's a great way to do study, but we also need to understand when the author is using a similar illustration for something that means something different. In this case, that's exactly what's going on here. Peter is using this as a positive. He is saying, uh, you need to be craving a pure spiritual milk in the same way that a, a baby would, would crave milk in order to grow and to grow up and to, and to be strong. So we are called, last one, the number five, we are called to be hungry. We are called to be hungry. So think about newborns and their desire to milk, or desire for milk. We need to crave more of God instinctively, eagerly, and incessantly. If you've ever uh, been around a newborn who is hungry, you know about it like right away, don't, don't we? <laughs> like we got some babies in the house right now. And one of them is being fed at this exact moment because otherwise Zeke will go crazy over there. And not, not the Zeke that was up here earlier, different Zeke. Uh, he, he gets upset when he's hungry too. Uh, but when, when a baby is hungry, there is nothing that will stop them from screaming except for getting what that, that need met, that they need to have milk. They need to have their nourishment. And that's how we need to be per- pursuing our, our relationship with God, that we are going after him and pursuing him instinctively, eagerly, incessantly, just with a, a, deep, a deep felt need for more and more of him, just craving more of God. And we have often equated this verse to mean, you know, this, this pure spiritual milk, it must be the word of God, right? And I think it certainly involves the word of God, but the jury's still out on exactly what all aspects uh, of uh, that, 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 that the author is talking about, that Peter is talking about here as we're pursuing God. Really, I think it's just more of him. And so we come to him, we're craving those things that draw us closer to him. One of those things certainly being the word of God for us. So craving him through his scriptures, craving time with him in prayer, or even just reflecting and letting him speak to us. And so we are, we are called to, to be pursuing that as well. So Peter, this whole time, he's been calling us in five different ways that we've talked about to, to step up in our lives, our walk with the Lord, calling us to be hopeful, calling us to be holy, reverent, loving, and hungry for more and more of him. I think the, the interesting thing and the, the challenge is it can, be, it, can be, it can be tough for us not to take a list like this or take some commands like this and to begin to turn them into something that they're not intended to be. Like, what, what is the difference between following these commands, trying to be holy like God is holy, versus being legalistic in our approach to, uh, to God? But how does, that, how does that play out? And 
Um, this, this is just a, it, it's a really good thought. It's a deep thought. It's something that we have to consider because God does want our lives to reflect the changes that, that are happening to us because of our relationship with him. That is part of walking with God, but we have to get it in, in the right order. Like we said before, it's not, it's not living out, uh, our, our, these, these, actions in order to define ourselves. It's allowing us to get our, our identifying features from God to define ourselves by how God defines us and then to live out of that identity. And getting, those the wrong, the, getting that the wrong way around, mixing that up can have really difficult consequences, tough consequences our relationship, on our relationship with him. Um, another way of looking at this is uh, the difference between training versus trying. Okay, this is something I was talking with a college group this, over the course of this weekend. And this is something that we talked about. The difference between training versus trying. Now, I, one thing that I, cannot, that I cannot stand in this world and I will not abide by is running long distances. Uh, I will not do it. Now, my wife loves, Mackenzie loves to run long distances. She finds it relaxing. Uh, <laughs> She, she, she finds a place like she gets her mind at peace while she's running. I don't know what it is, um, but not me, not me. Uh, I, I do not enjoy running. Now, she's planning to run a marathon in the fall. This would be her second marathon. It's been, you know, she did the other one a little while ago, but uh, no pressure, babe. Uh, well, I'll be tracking you now. But she's going to run. I didn't tell her I was going to tell this story. But she's going to run a marathon. Now, if she asks me, hey, honey, do you want to join me? in running this marathon. First of all, I'd say no. Uh, but if she were to ask me, and I, were, and I were to say yes for some crazy reason, and I said, okay, I'll run this marathon with you. And then I went out to the store, and I bought all the running shoes, and uh, I got like the sweatband deal, and I got like a belt that carries your water, and I had my AirPods all charged up, ready to go, and I bought inappropriately short shorts for running. You guys you know, those things that just don't work anywhere else. Uh, and and I got ready to go, and we show up for the marathon day, and we stand at the starting line, and they, whatever they do, blow the horn, fire the, the gun thing off, whatever, and we start running. How's that going to go? Not very well, right? Because I'm just showing up with the gear that day and trying to run this marathon. That's what trying looks like. That's what trying looks like. As we walk with God, it's just like, hey, I'm just going to show up, and I'm going to do all the stuff that he's told me to do. That's what trying looks like. And sometimes we turn all of those things. That, like it's, that's why legalism gets so exhausting because like you haven't done the background work to be ready for it. And you, it just doesn't work. It's not a system that works. You're not going to honor God with that you're, because you're doing it for the wrong reason to begin with. But if, if instead she asked me tomorrow and she said, do you want to run this marathon with me? And I said, yes. And then, and then I started running tomorrow. I'd probably only make it like 500 yards, but I, I could increase like a couple of yards every day. And if I trained every day from now until November when the race happens, when they fire off the gun, I think even me could probably finish the thing if I started training now. I don't think the time would be very good. I would not like it, but it would happen, okay? But that's the difference between training and trying. And Paul talks to, to Timothy about this idea of training in godliness. He says, train yourself in God. And he's actually making this exact parallel to training, physical training. He's like, physical training has some value, but, but spiritual training has value in all things. Becoming godly has value in all things. We are to be training ourselves, uh, training with God, and allowing, that's when he, God comes in and he does his work. Dallas Willard said, grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. We are not going to earn any favor from God. He's given that to us for free. We're not going to earn any gifts from God. He's already given them to us. But we can try in that sense. We can have effort, but really that effort needs to look like the training, not just showing up and trying. And so we spend that time with him behind the scenes. We get alone with him and we allow him to work in us and he honors that and then we begin to see our lives, our, our, our spiritual lives grow as we walk with him and as we train with him. 
This morning, we have a special treat as we just finish up uh, this portion uh, of our service. But we are going to have just a great time right now celebrating with some people who are in that process of training as followers of Christ. Kylie and Ada are going to be baptized this morning just as a way to outwardly and publicly declare their faith in Jesus Christ. And so um, we're just really excited about this process. If you, if you, if they're, where are they? Around here someplace? Maybe they're behind me. They're, they're over there. Okay, you're good. Nobody panic. Uh, they're ready. Here's what baptism is all about, okay? I'm just going to explain this really quickly. This is what we believe about baptism here at Oak Point Canton. We believe that it's something that Jesus has commanded us to do as an act of obedience when we have said yes to him as our personal Lord and Savior. Much like taking communion, it's one of those activities that outwardly demonstrates what has gone on inwardly in us, namely that we have received Jesus Christ as our Savior to rescue us from our sins, the penalty of our sins, uh, the, the power of our sins, and eventually the presence of our sin. And so he, he is going to, uh, the, the Lord is, is, is going to work in us and through us, and, and we are showing that on the outside. He's working internally in our hearts. He has done this thing internally in our hearts where he has regenerated our hearts. He's made old, new, just like we read from Ephesians 4, and he has brought new life into us. He's we have been reborn, like First Peter says, uh, into this new life with him. And so we are demonstrating that we're identifying with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so that's why we do baptisms uh, for those who have professed faith in Jesus Christ. Um, we are Believers Baptism Church. Uh, we can absolutely have fellowship with churches that believe something different uh, on that line, but that is where we fall, and that's why we practice baptism this way. For our infants, we do something uh, that we call dedication. We have the parents dedicate to raising the child in the Lord, and then when that child makes that profession, of faith, we allow them to demonstrate that through the act of baptism. And so I believe it's a, it's a question of obedience, and I don't believe it's a question of salvation, but it is a question of obedience as we walk along with Jesus. And as we looked at this morning, he does want us to obey. He does want us to do those things that set us apart uh, as, as God's people. And so that's exactly what is going on this morning as, uh, as these two uh, young adults are going to be baptized uh, in, in our midst here. Um, and we're just going to celebrate that. And so get ready to, to applaud and get crazy. And we're going to hear their stories before we do that. I'm going to turn it over uh, to, to Zeke and the baptizees. Let's do it. All right. Hi, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ada, and I am a sophomore at Grand Valley State University studying communication and minoring in photography. I was born and raised in Royal Oak, Michigan. I grew up having a lovely childhood. My house was filled with movies, books, music, and most importantly, good love. My family attended our local Catholic church where I attended Sunday school, and I got a foundation, but I never really took anything to heart. I knew about God, but I didn't really know God for myself. Fast forward a little bit, and during high school, I had horrible anxiety and depression and fell into so many bad habits with people so far from knowing God and the salvation found in Jesus Christ. We stopped going to church due to some problems within the church, and at this point in my life, I had never felt so alone. Until, one day, my best friend Levi invited me to church my sophomore year of high school. That Sunday, I'll never forget hearing for the first time how much God loved me and knew everything about me, down to my deepest, darkest secrets and the freckles on my face. Now, despite hearing all of these things, I still went through high school unsure of my faith and making poor choices. It really wasn't until I was in college, sitting in my freshman year dorm room, crying on the floor, and realized how alone I was that I started talking to God. Over the following months, I stopped all of my bad habits, broke up with my boyfriend at the time, and dove into the Word every day. When I got home that summer, I spent every second I could at the Salvation Army Church in Royal Oak. I was welcomed with loving, open arms and a new church family every week. That summer, my life was falling apart, but I was still smiling because I realized how good God's steadfast love for me was and my unexplainable peace amongst chaos. This was also the summer I accepted that my past didn't make me who I was and what God had planned for me, that Jesus really had died to save me. Now, I am about to finish my sophomore year of college. I joined campus ministry at Grand Valley and quickly joined a life group of kind and caring, supportive young women, which is also how I met Kylie. Then this past month, I was able to serve on a mission trip to Alaska during spring break, and I couldn't have asked for a better experience. The things I witnessed and the truly wonderful people that I was so blessed to serve with were once in a lifetime. This year has completely changed my life, and I can only thank God for how blessed I've been. Trust in Christ and Christ alone for your salvation. Yep. Okay, 
is my honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My name is Kylie, and I'm also a sophomore at Grand Valley. I'm studying nursing with a minor in biology. I grew up in a very loving Christian household in Belleville. I was raised going to a Methodist church and had a pretty solid background of the Bible and who God was, but in the years that I went to my old church, I never really grasped the idea that Jesus was someone I could talk to, rather than this guy up in the sky. I had lots of head knowledge of God's sacrifice and his love for us, but it was never something I believed in my heart. I went through most of my high school years saying I knew Jesus, but not living my life in a way that reflected his love. After leaving the Methodist Church and looking for new churches, we found Oak Point my sophomore year of high school, and I immediately felt at home. Going to youth group and meeting Zeke um, was a turning point in my faith, as I finally got to see what living a life for Jesus and walking in a personal relationship with him really looked like. I grew in my faith in a whole new way and went to college with my new understanding of Jesus and just how much he loves me as an individual. I found Campus Ministry, one of the ministry groups at Grand Valley, pretty quickly my freshman year and was introduced to a personal relationship with God even more. CM holds such a special place in my faith journey and is where the fire for Jesus really lit its flame in my heart. Since fully accepting Jesus as the one who knows every part of me, I have a brand new perspective and an unexplainable joy in life. I lead a life group through CM where I met Ada, and being able to take my background and my new understanding of who Jesus is and how much he loves us into guiding a group of college girls has been the most rewarding experience. Every day I wake up and I'm in awe of the work God has done in my life and in my community, both at home and at school. I'm so incredibly excited to take this last step in making my faith new and solidifying the promise I made to live every second of my life for our King. <laughs> 